minutes. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for the organizers for all the hard work in putting on this event. You could say, I think, safely that this was intelligently designed. So, Anyway, um, what I'm going to do tonight is basically argue that natural processes are not sufficient to explain the origin of life and the complexity of the cell. But in fact, I'm going to go one step further and actually argue that when we look at the scientific evidence at hand, it actually indicates that life's origin, and again, the, the structure of the cell, reflects the work of an intelligent agent. And in order to make my point tonight, I'm going to develop four lines of argumentation. The first is that all avenues taken to explain the origin of life through chemical evolution have led to dead ends. The second point I'm going to make is that work in prebiotic chemistry, which is designed to give insight and to validate chemical evolution, actually ironically demonstrate the necessity of intelligent agency in bringing about uh, the origin of life. Uh, work in synthetic biology where scientists are trying to explain or sorry, check that, are trying to create artificial cells in the laboratory, affirm the conclusion of the work in prebiotic chemistry. And then finally, the structure and the function of biochemical systems allows us to revitalize the watchmaker argument for God's existence, and in doing so, make a case, again, for intelligent design. Let me go ahead and, and make my first point. Now, Dr. Ruse described in very general terms uh, a textbook description for how scientists think the origin of life happened. But when you actually survey the scientific literature over the last 60 years, what you discover are myriad ideas that have been proposed by origin of life researchers. It's an incredibly complex landscape of ideas, and this diagram is taken from a book that I wrote with uh, Dr. Hugh Ross, an astronomer, called Origins of Life, where we attempted to try to give some organization to these ideas and show how they interrelate. And it's interesting to note that regardless of the specific model at hand, when you look at the origin of life question from a, an evolutionary perspective, there are key features that every model has to have in place. A source of prebiotic materials, a way to concentrate these prebiotic materials some, in some location on the early earth, a way to generate life's building blocks, a process to assemble those building blocks into compact flex molecules. You have to account for the origin of self-replication. You have to account for the origin of metabolism. You have to account for the emergence of protocells. And then finally explain how that protocellular entity evolves into the last universal common ancestor. What I'm gonna do in my opening statement uh, with regard to the first point is focus on the uh, these three um, ideas, namely the development of self-replication, the emergence of metabolism, and the aggregation of these systems to form protocells. Now this is, uh, these are very important steps in the origin of life because they essentially are looking to explain certain central features to, that all living organisms possess, namely that they operate um, uh, on, the, uh, on the basis or the outworkings of information-rich molecules. For example, proteins carry out virtually every activity inside the cell. The information needed to drive the production of those proteins and coordinate the operation of the cellular systems are information-rich molecules in the form of nucleic acids. And self-replication involves the duplication of information-rich molecules. Intermediary metabolism refers to a network of interacting uh, uh, chemical reactions in which small molecules interconvert through, again, an elaborate series of chemical pathways. And these small molecules generate the life's building, generate life's building blocks and also are uh, the byproducts of breakdown that generate energy for the cell to use. And of course, cell membranes are the boundary that separate the interior of the cell from the exterior environment. And these central features for life, as well as the requirements of all origin of life explanations, have led to three different approaches to the origin of life known as replicator-first, metabolism-first, and membrane-first scenarios. 
And what you see is that when you evaluate these scenarios, there are fundamental intractable problems that essentially invalidate each approach. For example, with regard to replicator-first scenarios, in order for a molecule to be a self-replicator, it has to be a homopolymer. A homopolymer is a, a large molecule comprise the smaller subunit molecules, and the backbone of that homopolymer has to have a regular repetitive uh, unit uh, that comprises it. It has to be a homopolymer. The backbone has to be, again, identical. This is a chemical requirement for self-replication. And as the late chemist Robert Shapiro demonstrated, when you take into account the complexity of the chemical environment on the early Earth, there are so many different interfering chemical reactions that exist that the, the generation of a homopolymer is virtually impossible. And this problem is fundamental regardless of what you think the first self-replicating entity might be. In fact, the problem is so severe, along not only the homopolymer problem, but other problems associated with self-replication uh, or replicator-first uh, scenarios, that the, uh, that the late Leslie Orgel said it would be a miracle if a strand of RNA ever appeared on the primitive Earth. With respect to metabolism-first scenarios, again, you're looking at these networks of chemical reactions involving small molecules. And these, uh, ca these catalytic networks, sorry, these chemical networks have to have some form of catalysis in order to drive the reaction of one uh, of a reactant into a product. And the problem here is that mineral surfaces, which have been proposed as the catalytic uh, materials for these proto-metabolic systems, have limited catalytic range, meaning that the products are going to have to migrate to other mineral sites in order for that pathway to uh, to be sustained. And this again is an, a virtually an impossible scenario. Uh, Le Leslie Orgel also said with respect to metabolism first scenarios that these would require an appeal to magic, a series of remarkable conditions, uh, a near miracle. With regard to membrane first scenarios, this is where I've actually contributed to the origin of life problem. Uh, a chemist, Jackie Thomas, and I wrote an article a few years ago where we evaluated membrane first scenarios. And what we showed is that in membrane first scenarios, each step in the process requires exacting environmental and chemical conditions in order for, again, that step in the membrane first scenario to transpire. And it turns out that each step requires a different set of in, in, exacting conditions, meaning that the pathway is essentially self stultifying. The bottom line is that you cannot explain the origin of life through the outworkings of chemistry and physics. Now, my second point is that work in prebiotic chemistry, ironically, demonstrates the necessity of an intelligent agent. Now, when you look at the scientific literature, you see a lot of experiments that have been done over the last 60 years that seem on the surface to support the notion of chemical evolution, where scientists go in the laboratory and they can generate life's building blocks, can assemble them into polymeric materials, they can generate uh, RNA molecules with a wide range of catalytic properties, they can generate self-replicating systems and, and, and generate protocellular entities. The problem with these experiments, however, is that they represent false success, not genuine success. At best, they simply demonstrate proof of principle. But as soon as you try to take the chemistry that's done in a laboratory environment and translate it to the conditions of the early Earth, the chemistry breaks down. It's not productive. That is, the chemistry discovered in the laboratory is not geochemically relevant. In order to demonstrate geochemical relevance, you have to be able to, in the laboratory, design, again, a realistic experiments that take into account the concentrations of materials on the early Earth, the energy sources that would be available. You have to take into account chemical interference. You have to take into account chemical stability. And another very important factor that has to be considered is researcher intervention, because these prebiotic simulation experiments are done with the oversight of organic chemists. And organic chemists, of course, would not have been present on the early Earth. And so you have a real problem with researcher intervention. And in fact, the researcher intervention, in my opinion, is unwarranted in virtually every prebiotic simulation experiment. Let me just illustrate with one example. Uh, this has to do with the RNA world scenario. This is one of the leading ideas in origin of life research that basically says the very first biochemical systems were exclusively RNA-based, and that this RNA world later 
invented the DNA protein world through uh, an evolutionary process. Now there's a lot of lines of evidence that people cite in favor of the RNA world model, one of which are experiments done in a laboratory showing that you can start with RNA building blocks and assemble fairly long RNA polymers using clay as a catalytic surface. But when you examine these experiments in detail, what you discover is that these are again highly unrealistic experiments where you, the researchers have been careful to exclude chemical interference that would prevent the ch RNA chains from growing or exclude chemical interference that would cause the RNA chains to break down once they formed. The researchers stopped the experiment at the just right time to prevent the RNA molecules from becoming too long because if they become too long they become irreversibly adsorbed onto the clay surface. And the clays that are used have to come from a particular source, they have to be processed by the supplier in a particular way, they have to be, then be treated in the laboratory in a particular way to prepare them to function as catalysts, and oh by the way, the building block materials are chemically activated to ensure that they would react. Paul Davies put it this way, as far as biochemists can see, it is a long and difficult road to produce efficient RNA replicators from scratch. The conclusion has to be that without a trained organic chemist on hand to supervise, nature would be struggling to make RNA from a dilute soup under any plausible prebiotic conditions. Simon Conway Morse generalizes this problem to say many of the experiments designed to explain one or other step in the origin of life are either of tenuous relevance to any believable prebiotic setting or involve an experimental rig in which the hand of the researcher becomes for all intents and purposes the hand of God. The bottom line here is prebiotic simulation experiments are actually empirically demonstrating the central importance of an intelligent agent in order to bring life into existence. And this conclusion is affirmed by work in synthetic biology where the goal of scientists is to create artificial cells in the laboratory. And one approach is a bottom-up approach where scientists start with simple chemicals and then try to assemble them into these chemical super systems that again assume many of the properties of life. And when you examine this work, what you, what you note is that this, this work is only successful because you have some of the best minds in the world employing rather sophisticated and elaborate strategies to carry out these experiments. These strategies uh, spawn very sophisticated protocols that require highly skilled chemists and biochemists to go into the laboratory utilizing sophisticated chemical instrumentation to carry out the production of protocells. That is, intelligent agency is necessary. Let me illustrate with one example. This is work that was published in 2008 in Science in which a team of researchers designed an enzyme from scratch that could carry out what's known as an aldol condensation. This is a chemical reaction that does not occur in biological systems. And in order to create this enzyme from scratch, these researchers employed a, an elaborate strategy that involved modeling the transition state, determining how to stabilize that transition state by surrounding it with chemical groups, by taking that understanding and then designing an enzyme active site and then building a protein that would fold to produce that enzyme active site. And then once this was d done, they then went into the laboratory and produced the enzymes and then vary the enzyme structure, fine tuning it to produce an enzyme that would function. This work required a, a team of uh, computer scientists, um, uh, sorry, a team of uh, quantum chemists, a team of computational chemists, protein engineers, biochemists, and molecular biologists. And it took hundreds of hours of supercomputer time, the use of massive databases of protein structures derived from studying proteins found in nature, again highly skilled chemists and sophisticated laboratory equipment to carry out this work. And the product of this work was an enzyme that quite frankly was laughable in terms of its performance compared to the enzymes that are found in biochemical systems. The, the authors conclude their paper this way, although our results demonstrate that novel enzyme activities can be designed from scratch and indicate the catalytic strategies that are most accessible to nascent enzymes, there is still a significant gap between the activities of our design catalysts and those of naturally occurring enzymes. Uh, my final point is this. 
that when we look at the structure and function of biochemical systems, they help us to revitalize the watchmaker argument, an argument uh, advanced by William Paley in the late 1700s that basically said, as a watch requires a watchmaker, life requires a creator. In Paley's day, a watch was the pinnacle of engineering achievement, and what William Paley noted is that a watch has certain properties that distinguish it from materials that are clearly produced through natural processes. And, and Paley argued that as a watch requires a watchmaker and living systems, biological systems, share many of the same properties as a watch, therefore one could rightly conclude that life requires a creator. And what's interesting to me as a biochemist is that when we have, what we have learned about biochemical systems is that their defining features are, are identical to the same features that we would recognize as evidence for the work of a human designer. In other words, when human beings design and create and invent, we produce systems that have certain characteristics. And when we look at the, the structure of biochemical systems and how they function, they again have those same characteristics. And so we can revitalize the watchmaker argument. And I'm just gonna give you one example of again, the similarity between biochemical designs and man-made designs by turning to the information rich molecules that are found in bio, biochemical systems, namely nucleic acids and proteins. Now what's interesting is that these systems um, are, are remarkable in their similarity to, um, again, man-made information systems. For example, Leonard Adelman, who is a computer scientist at the University of Southern California, recognized that the enzymes that operate on DNA are literally functioning as Turing machines. And a Turing machine is an abstract machine invented by the British mathematician Alan Turing that essentially forms the, fa the theoretical foundation for how computer systems operate. And Leonard Adelman realized that these enzymes that are manipulating DNA are functioning as actual Turing machines and, and employed that insight to, to found an area of nanotechnology called DNA computing where scientists are using the information in DNA in the same way that a computer scientist would treat a string of data and then are manipulating that data using the enzymes and cells, stringing, again these tur stringing together these Turing machines to perform incredibly complex computations. Again, the similarity between man-made designs and biochemical designs is absolutely startling. Now, in addition to that, Donald McDonald at Trinity University in Dublin, Ireland, has actually discovered that built within the structure of DNA itself is something known as an even bit parity code. And this is an, a, a coding device that computer scientists use to detect error in data transmission. And again, what's, a, what's a remarkable to me is the similarity between these biochemical systems and man-made constructs, which again helps us to revitalize the watchmaker argument. The, 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 the information systems inside the cell are ultimately defined by something known as the genetic code, which is a set of rules that relates the information in DNA and RNA into the information found in proteins. And it turns out that in recent years, researchers have discovered that the genetic code found in nature is exquisitely optimized for error minimization. In fact, the genetic code in nature exists as a statistical outlier compared to any conceivable random genetic code that could have been generated through chemical evolution. This has led Simon Conway Morris to say that the genetic code in nature displays eerie perfection and startling evidence of optimization. And again, optimization is a characteristic of man-made systems. And so the point here is that again, biochemical designs are eerie in their similarity to man-made designs. This allows us to develop a revitalized watchmaker argument and in turn use that to, to buttress the conclusions of other lines of argumentation I made tonight that namely life requires the work of an intelligent agent. What I've demonstrated by looking at replicator first scenarios, metabolism first scenarios, and membrane first scenarios is that there are fundamental intractable problems with the details associated with chemical evolution that work in prebiotic chemistry ironically demonstrates the central importance of an intelligent agent, that synthetic biology in the attempts to create artificial life in the lab affirm that conclusion, and that finally, again, the structure and function of biochemical systems allows us to revitalize a formal argument for design, namely the watchmaker argument. Thank you. Well, 
I'm, I'm obviously not going to say anything new at this point. So I just want to pull together what I've said before, because in a way, I'm, I'm seeing, you might say, why, why am I debating with somebody that I disagree so completely and utterly with? I mean, what's, what's the point of doing this? And I, I, I'm seeing that there is a great deal of point to doing this because I think it's bringing out some really important issues about the nature of science, about the, the way that we think. I agree with Dr. Rana that the problem of the, the origin of life is one hell of a difficult problem. I don't think anybody wants to deny that. I agree with Dr. Rana that scientists today do not have a full or even an adequate solution. I agree with Dr. Rana that there have been a lot of, shall we call them cowboys in this business, who have, you know, done a lot of speculating, what, as I say, Stephen Jay Gould used to call just so stories. They talk about it in sociobiology. You certainly see it here. So I, I don't want to disagree with any of those sorts of things. However, what I want to say is it's so instructive, isn't it? You've got what is a horrendously difficult problem. We've now got, don't forget, but at the same time, we've now, since the Watson Crick bottle, we've now started to get some tools that we can explore this. Uh, at first, it looked as though it was going to be easy peasy. But then within 10, 15, 20 years, it became clear that it was a lot more difficult than anybody thought a lot more difficult, and even today, I don't think anybody would want to deny that. So the question then is, where do you go from here? What, what's to be done? Do you throw up your hands? Do you take a biblical position? Now, as I say, if you're gonna take a biblical position and a biblical position, I can't stop you, but you're not doing science anymore. The question is, do you, at some level, have this, if I call it a hybrid, Dr. Rano will probably give me another word for it, but do you say, no, the science points me to miracles? And I want to say, no. I want to say no, because we are not coming to this problem, as it were, blank, without any experience, any more than coming to the Indian rope trick is blank without any experience. If I see the Indian rope trick or a boomerang, I don't immediately say, ah, Newton's laws don't work. I start to say, okay, what's going on here? Why does it look as though Newton's laws don't work? Because I know damn well they do. And I want to say exactly the same about the origin of life. It's a difficult problem. We've got some tools now. I think we are making some progress. We're not there yet. Probably we won't be there in my lifetime. I hope you'll be there in the lifetimes of some of you here, but perhaps not even then. But that's no reason to give up. That's no reason to give up the naturalistic approach. That's no reason to turn to miracles, not for religious reasons, but for scientific reasons. I want to say this is a paradigmatic example of a really tough problem where we've got some tools, an exciting, interesting, tough problem, and it's a paradigmatic example of why science doesn't give up, why science says we're not there yet, but let's keep trying because it's, the answers are there. The problem is not with the, it's, the problem is not with the problems, it's with our abilities to solve those problems. That if you like, in Thomas Kuhn's language, these are puzzles, not problems. I don't think anybody is ever going to solve, what shall I say, the Palestinian question. I mean, I, give, give, I don't think anybody's gonna solve the American Senate problem. I think that that is a problem which is insoluble. I don't think there's any solution to that. It's not a puzzle, there's no solution. But I do think that the origin of life is a puzzle. I do think that there's a solution. And I want to say, let's get at it. And isn't that, isn't that exciting? And to, to, to 
quote Genesis, isn't that what being made in the image of God is all about? Trying to explore that wonderful world that he's given us with the abilities that he's given us. Thank you. Dr. Fuzrana, final comment, five minutes. Well, I think what you've heard tonight are two presentations. One you might say is a ruse, and one you might say was based on fuzzy logic. Um, I wish I could be as clever as you, Dr. Ruse. <laughs> anyway, that's my, my feeble attempt. Um, what I basically tried to do tonight is to argue that, again, the origin of life and the complexity of the cell require the work of intelligent agency in order to account uh, for, again, the emergence of life on Earth. And I've demonstrated or I attempted to demonstrate that every explanation for the origin of life through chemical evolution encounters significant problems, encounters dead ends. Many of these problems appear to be intractable. I've shown that when you look at the work in prebiotic chemistry, the role of intelligent agency cannot be ignored in making laboratory experiments successful that's, that appear to validate different stages in the origin of life process. And it's, it's because of the central importance of intelligent agency in these experiments that I've argued that again, the origin of life appears to be the work of a mind. Again, the, the, the work in synthetic biology, attempting to create life in the lab, leads us to a similar type of conclusion. I've also talked about the design in biochemical systems that, again, I think points us to the work of a mind. So you have four separate lines of argumentation that lead us to essentially the same conclusion. Now, uh, as I have been critical of work in the origin of life, I want to be clear that I do have tremendous amount of respect and admiration for the scientists that are engaged in this work. Uh, they are a breed of un, unto themselves who are, are people that are consumed with I believe to be one of the most difficult problems in science. So I have nothing but admiration and respect for them. And the more that I study the work in Origin of Life research, the more I appreciate again the ingenuity and the insight that these researchers have brought to this problem. But again, time and time again, uh, the ideas that have been proffered turn out to, to not withstand the rigors of scientific testing. I believe it is possible to develop a scientific model that employs the work of an intelligent agent, a creator. And one of the things we're doing at Reasons to Believe is developing a, a scientifically testable creation model where we attempt to take these ideas from the realm of reading through the creation accounts in Genesis into the scientific arena where we're willing to put our ideas uh, to, the, to the test, where we're, we're putting our ideas in harm's way. And, and I think the, our model actually performs rather well in the face of those types of challenges. At the end of the day, this is really very much a discussion about the nature of science itself. Is science about methodological naturalism, where only a certain category of explanations are allowed? Or is science first and foremost about a methodology that takes hypotheses, ideas, theories, models, and the predictions that emanates from them and applies scientific testing to those ideas and allowing the best models to, per to persist and discarding those models that are failed models? And so again, I think it's very much a question of the philosophy of science to some degree. And I, as a scientist, would like to think that science has the capacity to discover truth as opposed to science being a game that is played where we only are looking for natural process explanations. I think methodological naturalism actually makes science impotent to answer some of the most important questions, not only in science, but in most of the important questions to humanity at large. Uh, one of the critiques of our position, of course, are the bad designs found in nature, or presumably bad designs found in nature, and I believe it's possible to develop a robust response to that very, very much that legitimate criticism. So again, uh, at the end of the day, I believe that I have, have demonstrated and made my case that indeed intelligent agency is required for the origin of life, 
And as much as I respect Dr. Ruse, I'm not sure that he's convinced me that natural processes are sufficient. Uh, what I see him doing, and I see other origin of life researchers do this as well, is essentially appeal to the future. And this is essentially a logical fallacy because we need to evaluate this question with the data that we have at hand today. And that data that we have at hand today suggests intelligent agency is required to account for the origin of life.